Hi everybody and welcome back to Paul DC Gemstones. This is the Colored Gemstone Academy. Now this week's lesson is going to be about gemstone treatments. Now this might be one of the most illuminating for some of you. Maybe you don't realize that almost all gemstones undergo some sort of treatment or enhancement to improve the color of that gemstone. And while we're on that subject, it used to really be called enhancements. You know, it, was just, it just was a nicer word. Oh, these are enhanced. They're special. They're enhanced. But actually the FTC, which is the Federal Trade Commission, thought that treatments were a more accurate term to describe what is done to most gemstones. Now, before you get alarmed about that, it is a very common practice. And most of these treatments are considered permanent treatments by the Gemological Institute of America. But first, let's talk about how long it has been going on. For as long as man or woman has been mining gemstones, they have been finding ways to enhance gemstones and sometimes even cover the flaws of a gemstone. So that's what we're going to talk about in this lesson. And um, so for most of you, you probably walked into a jewelry store and you looked at a beautiful gem and you don't know how it really got to that place. I think the first and most obvious question that a lot of you might have on your mind is when a gem undergoes a treatment, remember a treatment is a process, any process that improves the gem's appearance. But when a gem undergoes that, does it make it more valuable or does it make it less valuable? And that's a really, really good question. And I will answer it this way. Let's suppose that you have a house and you're going to put your house for sale and you decided you get your realtor, they come over, they check it out, they give you an idea of what it's worth, and then they say, here are some things that you can do to improve the appearance of that house. For example, if you put a new coat of paint on a house, they say that's the biggest return on investment that you can get when you're trying to sell your house. So the question is, did that treatment or that enhancement make that house more valuable or less valuable? Well, of course, it made it more valuable. Now that being said, there are certain gems that undergo no treatments whatsoever. Some of them are very common, like garnets. No, no treatments are done to a garnet. Uh, peridot. No treatments are done to a peridot. Sapphires. Now even sapphires, uh, very expensive sapphires, might undergo a heat treatment. But you have to remember that that potential for that color has to exist in the stone. You can't just heat a bunch of sapphires and have them coming out looking like the queen's jewels. It doesn't work that way. But that said, if you have a gem, a sapphire, for example, that you can verify has undergone no heat treatment whatsoever, because of that rarity, it might make that sapphire more valuable than a sapphire that looks the same, but had to undergo a heat treatment in order to achieve that. So what we're gonna go through is we're gonna go through most of the common treatments, and I know that there are new treatments that come all, along all of the time. I'm going to give you most, in alphabetical order, most of the treatments that gemstones undergo and what are the common gems that use that treatment. So we're going to start earlier in the alphabet with something called bleaching. Now bleaching, when you think of bleaching your laundry, what does it do? It makes something whiter, right? So if you have something like cultured pearls, and of course the ideal to get a cultured pearl would be a very, very nice natural white cultured pearl. Some of those cultured pearls will undergo a bleaching process to lighten uh, the color of that stone. Other gems um, like agates undergo a bleaching. In fact, in fact, a white agate, for example, I know a lot of, uh, a couple of years ago, it was very difficult to find white agate because there wasn't a lot of pure white agate that they were mining, so they had to resort to bleaching some of that. Now, is it still an agate, still have all of the properties of an agate? Yes. But sometimes, again, bleaching that's used to lighten or remove color from a gemstone. Simple enough. Pretty good, right? The next one that we're going to get to is something called cavity filling. Now, that's a process that is going to fill and seal some of the voids to improve the appearance of the gem. Now, keep in mind, when you're filling that void, you're also going to add a little bit of weight to that gem. And remember, that's how gems are sold, by their carat weight. Now, where does this take place? Sometimes with rubies, sometimes with sapphires, 
uh, tourmaline, which is a, a, something that comes in a variety of different colors, uh, some opals, and even emeralds will go through cavity filling, although uh, emeralds use a much more common fracture filling, which we'll talk to a little bit later on when we get to that part in the alphabet. Uh, one that we covered on another one of our lessons, which is when we were talking about Druzy and we took a trip down to Brazil and we showed you the Druzy mines. Um, Druzy undergoes a, uh, a chemical treatment. They call it chemical vapor deposition, CVD. And what they're doing is they're heating an element up to a very high temperature so, till that element becomes a vapor that gets deposited onto that gemstone. Now that's something that I call a treatment that is skin deep. For example, if you've ever seen a mystic druzy or a mystic topaz, that, un that uses that chemical vapor deposition. Now you've seen uh, that, top that mystic topaz is a beautiful stone. It's like a rainbow of colors in, a, in what is once a clear topaz. But that is a coating on the top. It doesn't go throughout the stone. But I think it's a really, uh, it's a nice treatment for topaz and a nice treatment for uh, Druzy for sure. And then there is colorless impregnation. Now what is colorless impregnation? Well in the case of turquoise, which is where it is most common, it's where they, t actually I'm going to show you, this would be uh, a piece of turquoise, for example, that was just, I, I took it out of the ground like this when we were in Nevada and it has not been what we call stabilized. Well, that's what colorless impregnation is, where they're using a wax or a resin to infuse it into the, to the rough. And then when they polish, it might come out, you can see where there's a little color of turquoise there, but that's what would happen when you put that resin in there and then you polish it. So again, that's a very common treatment that you see in most of your turquoise out there. But it can also be used um, with jadeite jade or nephrite jade and where you're filling that those uh, it actually makes them more stable as well and easier to work for the gem cutter or the gem polisher when they're working with the stone and then we get one that is very very common and probably too many uh, examples to mention and that's dyeing there are a lot of gemstones that are dyed quite commonly and it's an accepted practice Although, once again, in that other lesson I talked about that word disclosure, you have to trust your gem expert to give you that information about dyeing. Now, where do they do that? Now, what's it for? It's to add color, it's to deepen color, or to change the color altogether. I'll give you a good example of where were some of the gems. N num number one would be pearls. We already talked about that. We talked about pearls and mother of pearl maybe going under, undergoing the bleaching, but also the dyeing. You will see, if you've ever seen like a black mother of pearl, which I've done over the years, a lot of times that is dyed, or you'll see some pearls dyed to look like a black pearl or a golden pearl. Now, black pearls and golden pearls can exist in nature, but a lot of times, and, and kind of let the price be your guide, uh, a lot of times when you're seeing beads that are dyed, uh, lapis is another great example of that. I love lapis, it's a beautiful blue stone. A lot of lapis in the world is dyed to deepen the color of that blue. Now personally, for me, I made a decision a long time ago that I will not use any lapis that is dyed. I want only natural lapis. And there's a good way to test that. You know what acetone is, that's your uh, nail polish remover. If you dip a piece of uh, lapis in acetone and that acetone turns blue, that means it's been dyed. If you put a piece of lapis that's natural in the acetone, nothing will happen to it. it. The acetone will remain a clear color and it won't affect the color of the lapis. So that's good to know. Uh, where else is dyeing used? Uh, turquoise. I'll give you a great example of turquoise. I remember when I was on Shop NBC in its earlier days and I had a today's top value that was the Mojave Green and the Mojave Purple turquoise with a bronze metal matrix inside. And I told everybody, especially with the purple and even with the green, I said, this is not the natural color of the turquoise. You have to have a certain quality of turquoise to even accept the dye, but that's an example of a dyed turquoise. Now, most turquoise is not dyed, uh, but it is gonna have that colors, 
colorless impregnation that we had before. So that's just a few of the treatments. We're going to take a quick break and I'll be back with even more of the gem treatments that you're going to learn about. Well, as we continue our discussion on the common gemstone treatments, just a reminder, most people are very surprised to learn that more gems are treated than are not. And it's a very common practice. And as long as it's disclosed and is a legitimate treatment that is recognized by experts like the Gemological Institute of America, you're absolutely fine. And it really does add value and beauty to a gemstone. Well, we are going to go back into our alphabet where we got up to the letter F on our treatment. And the next one is going to be called fracture filling. And fracture filling is most common in emeralds. In fact, during, in the process of emeralds, I believe they call that, or at least the, the term we use is oiling an emerald. What you need to know about an emerald, there are certain gems that don't have as much natural clarity as other gems do. For example, you can find an amethyst that's really beautifully clear under 10 power magnification, no inclusions whatsoever. Uh, and then you get to some that might have some you know, minor inclusions. Then you get to an emerald. When I wrote about emeralds in my Color Gemstone book that I wrote many, many years ago, I talked about how emeralds were categorized differently than every other gemstone when it comes to clarity. And the reason is this. It's, it's very common for an emerald to be, have many inclusions that are even apparent to the naked eye. So my, the analogy that I used in my book, as I said, grading an emerald is like that science test that you took in school where everybody in the class did so bad or badly or had such a poor grade, let's put it that way, that it was graded on a curve. In, in the gemstone business, certain gemstones like emeralds and tourmaline is another one are rated on a curve. It's acceptable to see those visible inclusions uh, from a gem expert in an emerald because they know that most emeralds don't have that clarity. Well, one of the treatments that they developed to deal with that apparent lack of clarity or the actual lack of clarity to make it apparently look more clear is to fill those fractures within the stone. And they infuse it with an oil and it makes it appear like it has a much better clarity than it do does. Now, this is sort of the exception to the rule. I talked about how most treatments are considered permanent by the Gemological Institute of America. In the case of emeralds, over time, that fracture filling that was filling that, that oil that was filling that opal might leach out over time, especially with repeated wear, repeated cleanings and things like that. So there may be a time in an emerald's life where it would have to be retreated with that fracture filling. But that's probably not something you, most people are going to have to worry about. Now we will get to the most common and probably most of you have heard of this one is a heat treatment. And a heat treatment is exactly like it sounds. In fact, when I was in Brazil and we saw the, the amethyst crystals that were too light in color that they didn't think would make a good amethyst, they take that, they put it into an oven and they heat it up for a period of time. And a heat treatment is anything that you can do that will either lighten color, in some cases darken color, uh, it's widely used in uh, sapphires, rubies, uh, citrine, as we already mentioned, tourmalines, there's really far too many uh, to mention. And it might surprise many of you also to know that that's one of those treatments that dates back thousands of years. And one of the earlier lessons in the Color Gemstone Academy, I talked about Pliny the Elder and how he wrote a book, actually an encyclopedia, and some of the volumes were about gemstones. And he talked about treating gemstones about 2,000 years ago. They knew that you could heat a, a, tram, a, a gemstone to transform the color of that. So that's, as I said, too numerous to, to talk about all the ones that undergo that. But it's a very common and very accepted treatment by the Gemological Institute of America. Now we get to something called irradiation. Now, irradiation might be a scary term for some of you because you think of, hmm, if I get irradiated, I'm being exposed to radiation. That's not good. Um, radiation is what it sounds like, irradiation. It's, it's a bombard, bombarding it with electromagnetic radiation. However, it is completely safe, considered permanent, and it's actually regulated by the Nuclear 
uh, regulatory commission. And where that's most common is in blue topaz. So if you've ever seen blue topaz, most topaz is really colorless or it can come in other colors naturally. But most of their natural blues wouldn't be able to become as dark as a London blue or even a Swiss blue. Most of it would probably be a sky blue. So it undergoes this very safe irradiation treatment and actually this was first developed in London, which is where they got the name London Blue Topaz from, ironically, where they do that electromagnetic bombardment over a period of time. And then they let it rest for a period of time because that's why I say it's regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission because they want to make sure that it's completely safe and has no apparent radiation long after that treatment. So it really takes that stuff out of circulation for some time and it's one of the reasons why your London blues, uh, and it's a costly uh, process too, your London blues and Swiss blues are gonna be more expensive than your sky blues. Now we'll get into something that's probably most reserved for the opal trade. And one is called a smoke treatment. And the smoke treatment was devised to darken the background color of the opal. For example, most opals are a, a kind of a white crystal clear opal with a play of color. Well, the most expensive opal is going to be something that's called a black opal where the body color of the opal is dark and it really changes the appearance of that play of color as well. So what they do, two treatments, one is called a smoke treatment and they're literally putting it in, uh, baking it in fire and the soot gets infused <laughs> into that opal and changes the background color and improves the apparent appearance of the play of color of that opal. Another one is called a sugar treatment and some folks refer to this one as an acid treatment. Now what they do is, is the sugar treatment, they take a fruit juice solution, they saturate it with sugar and they immerse it in sulfuric acid. And once again the, the result is it darkens the body color of that opal and makes it appear like a black opal. Now, if you're buying a black opal, and this is another one where I say, let price be your guide, you can get sugar treated opals or acid treated, uh, smoke uh, treated opals, and you're never gonna pay as much as you would if it were a natural lightning ridge black opal where the body color was already that color. But Consider, considered an acceptable treatment by the Gemological Institute of America. Now we're going to get to something that I think, in my opinion, is the most controversial of treatments. And I'm going to go ahead and say that I don't think it's really um, something that you, it's something you need to be aware of because there's something called surface diffusion, or if you've ever heard of a diffused ruby or a diffused sapphire. They look spectacular. You probably, most people wouldn't be able to tell it from a really expensive, beautiful blue sapphire or beautiful deep red, ruby red uh, ruby, blood red ruby. But what a surface diffusion is, is they take a combination of chemicals and a very, very high temperature. And they heat that gem to the melting point of that gem. And those high chemicals uh, become a part of the crystal structure of the gemstone. But much like we talked about with chemical vapor deposition, it's only the topmost layer of that ruby or the topmost layer of that sapphire. It makes the whole thing look like it's a, a really expensive ruby. I'm not necessarily opposed to people doing it, but you absolutely must. It is critical that they disclose that to you, that this is really a job that has been done to fundamentally change the crystal structure or, or you know, at least the color structure of that ruby or that sapphire. Uh, so that's what you need to know about surface diffusion. And now the last of the treatments is something else that I would say has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And it's what we call surface modifiers. So surface mo modifiers would be, and this, this would have happened, you know, many, many years ago. It, uh, you've heard stories, anytime you take gemology classes, you hear stories about somebody who had, 
either grandma's emerald and it, it was just this family heirloom and it must be worth a fortune. So they take it to a jeweler or a gemologist and they say, you know, what's, what's grandma's emerald worth? And you're going to say, 10 bucks. <laughs> and you're like, wait, what? what? Well, because ba even back then they would use things like a clear crystal quartz and put a, a, a green colored foil underneath it and it makes it look like it's an emerald. So those would be an example of surface modifiers, uh, foiling, um, putting some backing on a gem, um, uh, painting. Now, I don't consider these legitimate in the conversation of, uh, you know, gem quality gems. Uh, is it acceptable for costume? Absolutely. And again, you're not probably going to buy a $10 costume necklace and worry about what the provenance of that necklace is. But um, that's, you need to know that surface modifiers do indeed exist. Now, when we talk about backing, because I, I wanna make sure that you do understand this one very important difference. There are also things, and notice I'm not really including this into the treatment discussion. But when I talk to you other times, when I, when I talk to you about um, the abalone shell, like where's my abalone shell? Right up here. When I talked to you about an abalone shell, and I talked about how sometimes I do abalone doublets or triplets, and I do the doublet because it's putting a, it's, it's not what I would call a treated stone, it's what I would call an assembled stone. And the same is true of an opal doublet. An opal doublet is not treating the opal whatsoever. They're taking a thin layer of, of um, Australian opal, and they put a dark, they set it on top of a dark uh, background, like onyx, for example. I might even put a crystal layer on top, a clear crystal layer on top. So you have, that's a triplet. So doublets and triplets are not what I would call treated stones, that they're what I refer to as assembled stones. So the difference between that, when I talk about backing a stone to make it look like something else, is a completely different conversation. Well, that is going to conclude what I hope was not confusing to you, but the, the, uh, the lesson on treating and treatments and common treatments of gemstones. Remember, if you like what you're learning, please hit the subscribe button. It really does help me out. And then you can always click on that bell icon. And anytime I have a new video that's going to be available for you, you will be notified of that. That's going to do it for this lesson. I'll see you all next week on Paul DC Gemstones, my YouTube channel. And it is the uh, Colored Gemstone Academy. Thanks so much for watching. Thank mm -hmm. you.